Hey guys, welcome back to the Maranatha Global Bible Study on the Book of Revelation. My name is Dalton Thomas. We're going to be jumping back into the Book of Revelation today on one of my most favorite passages in the entire Word of God, Revelation chapter 5. We're going to jump right into it. Uh, before we do, if those of you who are watching this, wherever you're finding this, whether on the FAI app or finding this on YouTube or uh, somewhere else, who knows where, and you haven't yet seen Ballads of the Revelation, I would encourage you to go watch it. This was a feature film that we released in November of 2020 that is a, uh, quite a bizarre, but I think a very beautiful film in that it explores the book of Revelation through musical form and through the dream world of an 11-year-old child, my son, Isaiah, actually. We took the idea of a little boy falling asleep and envisioning what the book of Revelation looks like chapter by chapter, but by telling the story through songs. So it's a very, it's definitely not everyone's cup of tea. Some people are gonna find it a little bit too, uh, you know, people who are very linear are gonna, uh, you know, struggle with the the complexity of the uh, symbolism and metaphor and artistic license that we took musically and cinematically to bring the story of the Book of Revelation to life. That said, I would encourage everyone to watch it, even if you go, actually, that's not my style of music, and ah, that's not my style of film, you know, whatever. I would encourage you to watch it because. There's a lot of messages in these songs that are very much, I think, uh, how should I say? It, it, it's like, you know, when you're drilling for water, drilling for oil, you, you crack through and it starts to spill out. I think there's, there's some really beautiful phrases in the film that help unlock some things. One of the more uh, important songs in the film is called Heroes Worth a Damn. And the chorus of the song, uh, more or less, says all of our heroes, they're not worth a damn. No one can take the scroll except f f the scroll from the hand of the Father. No one but the lion and the lamb. And the whole idea and the imagery around the song and the film, we had all of the different, uh, we had a, a bunch of extras. We did a big rooftop party here on the Syrian border at this old army base. And we had everyone put faces of world leaders uh, uh, duct taped to their face, pictures of people's faces. And in the end, uh, the, the act of taking the masks off and you know, breaking our alabaster jars and pouring out, uh, pouring out, essentially declaring as we were doing this, this act in the film of taking the masks off and putting them on the ground, it's not to disrespect the, the people in their lives and the, these people who live. It's to say, none of these people can save us. None of these people can bring justice to the earth. All of our heroes, and now everyone's heroes are different. In America, we have certain heroes. In Germany, we had other heroes. China, you have other heroes. And Israel is other heroes. We, we try to take good guys and bad guys because to one, one person, that, that guy's a hero and to another person, that guy's an enemy. And the point is this, throughout history, we've had all kinds of different heroes, good guys and bad guys, tyrants and saints. You know, it's quite a powerful thing to see Mother Teresa next to Hitler. We're not trying to draw a comparison between the two other than to say that none of them are worthy to take the scroll and to loose the seven seals. None of them are worthy. All of our greatest heroes fall short. All of our heroes aren't worth a damn. You say, oh, well, you know, Dalton, we've gotten some emails from people. Did you have to use a swear word? Did you have to use coarse language to make the point? And that's not something we just did lightly and threw that in there. We're using a heavy, strong language, not super heavy, but strong language to basically say, to, to, to connect with the groan that John is groaning with in Revelation chapter 5. That's what we're looking at today. We're tapping into the groan in the heart of the apostle when he started weeping. And this is a very emotional part of the Bible. It's one of the more emotional scenes in the Bible, actually, is this gut-wrenching cry, this weep, this groan, this agonizing pain that John feels when he hears that no one can take the scroll. Before we move any, move any further, let's just jump into the text and give context to where we are. And then we'll actually jump through this and, and go through Revelation chapter 5, which is in a very important pivot. Chapter 5 is the chapter that leads us into the breaking out of the final tribulation, the age-ending time of trouble before the Lord returns. Chapter 5 kicks off a 42-month 
time period, a three and a half year time period that literally leads to the physical bodily return of Jesus to the earth to establish his government and kingdom in Jerusalem. Chapter five is where it all goes down. This is where everything begins to barrel forward towards the final consummation of this present age. Now, as we've said in recent sessions, the structure of the book of Revelation is very simple. Anyone can understand it. Chapter one, John has his reunion with Jesus on the island of Patmos. Chapters two and three is seven letters to seven churches in Asia Minor in the time of John the Apostle. Revelation four, <coughs> excuse me, Revelation four and five is the John's experience and encounter in the throne room that kicks everything off. In Revelation 4, in our last session, he sees the Holy Father. He sees the Father who, everyone's gathered around the Father on the throne, and he has a scroll in his hand. But the one on the throne, the focus is not yet the scroll. The focus is on the Father. And everyone around the throne is declaring over and over, day and night, day and night, they're singing, holy, holy, holy. Now, as we said in that, that session, they're not saying you are morally righteous, morally pure. That's not what they mean by holy. What they mean by holy is that you transcend everything. From you came everything. You are other than everything. You're not created. There's nothing like you. You stand alone. And they can sing the same word over and over again because they have sight and revelation of the wonder of the one in front of them. It's a very profound reality and a very profound chapter that revelation uh, the, the gift of sight and revelation, eyes wide open to behold the wonders of God, sustains the human heart to gaze for endless ages. You don't get bored. The only reason you get bored is because you're dull and you don't have a spirit of revelation. The holy cry pushes us into some depths in the person and the work and the wonder of the Godhood of God that other words can't convey. Now, Revelation 5, there's a transition. We see the one in the throne is holding a scroll in his hand. Now, the story in Revelation 5 revolves around the scroll and this crucial, critical question that John hears, who is worthy to take the scroll and loose its seals this is the, the jugular question and the jugular element of Revelation chapter 5. Before we go through the chapter, I want to give what I would consider, I'm going to outline what I would consider to be the five main messages of chapter 5. Five main messages. I'm just going to read them out and then we're going to go through them. Number one is the magnification or the exaltation of the worth of Jesus at the end of natural history. It's the exaltation of the unsearchable riches of Jesus at the end of natural history. I mean, think about this. Right before the Great Tribulation begins, what's the thing right before it? It's a song. <laughs> a song revolving around what? Worthy are you to take the scroll and loose its seals. The worth of Jesus is the thing that kicks off the Great Tribulation. There's a lot of people who are interested in end times, a lot of people who are interested in uh, you know, events and stuff, but guys, the events happen because the revelation of the worth of Jesus strikes the hearts and the minds of those around the throne and those on the earth who understand what's happening. It's a very critical, powerful reality that the worth of Jesus is what sets this thing in motion. Now, this, the basic storyline of Revelation 5 is that the Father has the, the, the scroll, and then they sing, who's worthy? And then they say, no one, no one's worthy. And John starts weeping because no one can take the scroll. Then someone says, John, stop weeping. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. He can take it. So John wipes the tears from his eyes. He looks over and he sees. He says, that's not a lion. He says, I saw a lamb standing as though slain. And this song erupts. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to take the scroll and to loose its seals. Why? Because you were slain and you redeemed men from every tribe, tongue, and nation, and you will reign on the earth with them. 
And what happens? Jesus, the lamb, the lion, approaches the throne, takes the scroll, tears the first seal. In our next sessions, we're jumping into the tearing of the seals, the judgment events of the Great Tribulation. And the first seal kicks off the Great Tribulation. We're going to spend uh, quite a number of weeks in these preliminary opening judgment events described in Revelation 6. Joel and I are, have been in dialogue the last few weeks about how to go deep in this and to, to, to uh, articulate these events in such a way that uh, it's simple and clear, but it also gives... Uh, insight into the intertext, what we call the intertextuality of these events. Meaning the first seal, it's not as though we only have one verse about the first seal. We have hundreds of verses about what takes place during the first seal. Hundreds of verses. So it's going to take some time. But the point is this, the first message of Revelation 5 is the worth of Jesus. The second message is the diverse excellencies or the diversity of of Jesus's person and worth. So it's not just that you're worthy. That's message number one. He's worth it. He's worth anything that we have to give. He's more valuable than anything we could lose or gain in life. He's better. He's worth it. He's superior. He is the great superior pleasure, the great superior glory. He is the greatest of all. That's message one. Message two is his worth is not just a simple kind of worth. He's very diverse and very complex. Yes, he's simple, but guys, there's some tensions in his person. You say, why is that? Why would you classify that as one of the major messages of Revelation 5? For this very simple reason. Those in heaven, when, he, when John's around the throne, they say, behold, the lion and John sees a lamb. Which means this. There are diverse excellencies in the person of Jesus that seem like contradictions, but are not contradictions. Look, he is a fierce lion, but he is also a sacrificial tender lamb. He is the creator of all and the sustainer of life, but he is the son of man, the son of David, who was born of a virgin and who grew as a natural Jewish man. He is the judge of the living and the dead who will hold all accountable and judge them for their sin. He's also the redeemer and the advocate who bled on behalf of the, of the world. We see that he loves infinitely, yet his wrath is terrifying. We see that his mercy knows no end. And yet we see that his justice is furious. The, the diversity within Jesus, you know, pop culture Christianity does not allow for diversity within Jesus' personality. It has created a very simple, manageable Jesus. If you did kind of a personality test on him, he's very one-dimensional. He's a very simple guy. The book of Revelation presents a very diverse image, a very diverse picture of a man who is, on one hand, the most joyful man who ever lived, and yet a man who's totally consumed with vengeance and wrath. Now, some people are, are, are totally cool with the idea of mercy, but they're offended at the idea of judgment. The book of Revelation, I believe, was given in large part to give us a window into the revealing. I mean, at the end of the day, the name of the book is the revelation of Jesus, the revealing of Jesus. That's why this book exists, is to reveal Jesus. The third message is the good news of the judgment of God. The good news of the judgment of God. What do I mean by that? Meaning this, John weeps in Revelation 5. Why? Because no one can execute justice. Justice is executed when judgment is executed. What's interesting right now and profoundly hypocritical is that we live in a generation that's obsessed with justice and completely offended by judgment. It's, it's illogical. It's utterly contradictory. And at its core, it's deeply hypocritical. We demand justice, and yet we demand that God not execute it because he's not allowed to. Humanism... Secular humanism is predicated on the idea that justice is good and judgment is bad. The biblical worldview mandates by logic, and it's 
good news, guys, that justice comes through judgment of a good, faithful, kind, merciful, just God executing judgments on the earth. Look, when, when John is weeping, when his tears are flowing and he's burdened and he's groaning, he's saying, no, there must be, someone must be able to loose the seals. The reason he's weeping is because he's conscious of the level of un- injustice that is covering the earth, even in his day. Because guys, the blood of the saints was being poured out. Is at the height of the Roman Empire, the depravity, the corruption, the violence, the degradation that's taking place under the advance of the Roman Empire. John's groaning because he's going, we need someone to, to do something about this. Just, injustice cannot abide forever. When, when will this someone break the cycle of world history of bloodshed and corruption and sin and violence and evil? If no one can do it, it's going to continue on forever. And I think this is the sickness in the heart of mankind is that we've lost sight of justice true justice because we will not allow for a God who will execute justice through his intended means, which is the judgments of God. What John, he, he goes from weeping to being joyful because he understands that the judgment of God means the implementation, the execution of justice on the earth. When we cry out for justice, we're crying out for judgment. You know, in Isaiah, we read this, that when the judgments of God are in the earth, the inhabitants of the earth learn righteousness. The judgments of God are all about the justice of God. If you care about justice, you care about judgment. And there's a lot of confusion today in the body of Christ, particularly in the God is good world. Meaning, you know, there's kind of like, uh, there's these different camps within the body of Christ globally. You have some camps that are very, uh, you know, we're sinners, Jesus died on the cross, and it's just kind of a legal thing, and, you know, he bought us with his blood. It's just kind of a legal thing. You know, it's very Reformation heavy, you know, that it's justification by faith. There's not really an emotional connection. It's more like we were acquitted in a, uh, you know, in a courtroom case, and now I'm free. It's more of a legal freedom. But then there's, uh, and they, they, that crowd doesn't struggle as much with judgment because they think more in terms of legal judicial thinking. Now, there's the other side that doesn't think in terms of legal. They're, let's call them the, the, the worship, uh, the goodness of God camp, the prophetic, the Holy Spirit people that have tapped into the goodness of God. They've tapped into the tenderness, the gentleness, the mercy of God, the father heart of God, the affections of Jesus. They've tapped into this tender, the soft sides of the heart of our Father and of our Savior. But within that, there's an inability to consider the hard realities within Jesus. And therefore, that crowd is just as adverse to the idea of judgment as the secular humanistic crowd who won't allow for the judgments of God either. What the Lord wants to do through the book of Revelation in our day is recalibrate our generation to the good, good news of the judgment of God. That if you want to see evil wiped from the earth, start praying Maranatha and start giving your life to what Jesus commanded us to give our lives to, to hasten the day when justice will be established on the earth. The fourth message of Revelation 5 is the dynamic relationship between the prayers of the saints and the end of the age. There's a very critical passage in Revelation chapter 5. It describes, he says, I saw, right after he, 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 he turns and he sees the, the lion and the lamb, he says, I saw that the, the, around, around the lion and the lamb, around the throne, there's people holding harps in one hand, bring, harps, music, do, 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 ding, they're playing music, and then they're having bowls in the other hand. And the harps are music, and the bowls are full of the prayers of the saints. Now, the thing is, the prayers of the saints, the incense that's coming out of there, they're filling up the bowls. Now, as the bowls are filling up full of incense, as intercession, as prayer is maturing and unifying globally across the world, and I believe it's unifying around the Maranatha cry, come Lord Jesus, as that message is filling up the bowls in heaven, it is setting in motion the releasing of the judgments of God on the earth. 
There is a relationship. It is not as though God wakes up one morning after taking a nap or, you know, taking a nap in the afternoon. He wakes up and goes, ah, it's 4 p.m. Let's, let's do some judgments. No, there's a relationship between the intercession, the prayers, the proclamation, the incense of the saints that's stirring events that break out in heaven that then break out on earth. This is throughout the book of Revelation. We touched on it in our last session, but I want to touch on it again. Revelation 5, Revelation 8, Revelation 19. There's multiple chapters in Revelation where we see the prayers of the saints trigger judgment events on the earth. Revelation chapter 8, right before the, the trumpets are sounded, it says that the prayers of the saints were arising. And then the angels went and they took from the prayers of the saints and they cast judgments to the earth. We pray God judges. We pray God executes judgments on the earth. This is something that's theologically just, there's a disconnect in modern contemporary popular Christian culture. We don't think of prayer in context of judgment. Yet the book of Revelation revolves around this basic concept that's established in Revelation 5. When the prayers of the saints arise, they fill bowls, and those bowls being filled trigger judgment events on the earth. You know, this is not like having your local, you know, Wednesday night prayer meeting. Everyone gets together and says, you know, dear Lord, thank you for, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, please, you know, make sure that we become, uh, you know, our business is good and we're healthy and happy. No, this is the kind of, that, not to mock that kind of prayer meeting, but the kind of prayer that we see in the book of Revelation is very much rooted in a how long cry. For example, in, in Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, we see that under the altar, there's people making intercession, praying in heaven. And as they're praying, they're praying, Lord, how long, how long, how long until you what? Avenge our blood, release justice, release judgment on the earth. How long? Now, here's a powerful thing, guys. Prayer is happening in the throne room during, before, during, and after the Great Tribulation. Prayer is taking place in triggering world events. But these prayers are not, you know, domesticated, make my life better prayers. They are how long until you avenge the blood of the righteous prayers. They're how long until you come. We're groaning for you, Jesus. You're worthy to take the scroll. So loose its seals. I'm prophesying this right now. The future of prayer meetings across the earth in our generation are moving towards language that looks more like Jesus take the scroll and tear the seal than they do Jesus make us happy, healthy, and wealthy. What the Lord is doing on the earth in our generation is centering us around this central groan and cry for the judgments of God on the earth. The fifth main message of Revelation 5 is the relationship between redemption and consummation. This is also a disconnect within the modern Christian mind. The, con the connection, the relationship between redemption and consummation. Meaning, so many of us were born and bred, cut our teeth on a, a, a gospel of forgiveness. That Jesus, when he came, he came to forgive us. He came to die on the cross. And that's more or less it. He came to bleed and to save us, to forgive us, to justify us. But what we see in Revelation 5 verses 9 and 10 is this. Listen to the language of this. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, which means you are worth it. You're deserving of it. You can do it. You should do it. You're worthy to release the end time judgments of God on the earth. Here's why. For or because you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and nation and have made us kings and priests to God. Look at this. And we shall reign on the earth. We shall reign on the earth. The people who are in heaven around the throne room are saying this, we shall reign on the earth. Guys, that's a very powerful reality. 
Look at the, the, the connection, the grammar, the structure of verses 9 and 10. You're worthy to take the scroll and to loose end time judgments because you bled, you redeemed people, and we will reign on the earth. Meaning this, when Jesus gave his blood, when Jesus gave his life, he wasn't giving his life just so that you could be justified, just so that you could be forgiven. He was giving his life and his blood so that you could be redeemed and bought and to reign on the earth with him, which means this. If you die before or during the great tribulation and you are in the presence of the Lord, you are not going to stay there forever. You are actually going to return to the earth where you will reign. Do you know what it means to reign? Do you know what it means to reign on the earth? Do you know what it means to reign on the earth with Messiah in Jerusalem? Guys, this is the reason why the cross. This is the reason why the resurrection. This is the reason why he adopted us, why he purchased us, why he regenerated us, why he justified us, why he redeemed us. He bought us so that we would reign on the earth. This is the dynamic relationship. This is the, the reality for which we're living. This is the reality for which we're living. Jesus didn't buy you so that you can just go up to glory and float around on, on clouds and live this ethereal world in some fantasy land. Jesus cares about the earth. Look, at, I, want to, I want this to, to settle into our minds. He's worthy to take the scroll because he bled and we will reign on the earth. So this means then that if we're going to reign on the earth, the earth is not going to get blown up at the end of the tribulation. Jesus is like, okay, I got everyone out. Hit the destruction button. Beep. And blows up. And Jesus is like, well, that was weird. That, that, that whole like 6,000 year period, that was, that was crazy. Just blow the earth up. We don't need it anymore. No, guys, the earth will abide. The earth will remain. You say, well, yeah, what about passages about, you know, the earth passing away? What about passages like what Peter said, where the earth is going to be consumed in fire? Guys, the, the, the consuming of the earth in fire is to not to destroy the earth, is to cleanse the earth. Like he cleansed you and I. When we were redeemed by the Lord, he didn't destroy us and blow us up so that we didn't exist and he made a new version of us. He baptized us with the Spirit and with fire to regenerate us and to cleanse us and to redeem us and make us into a new creation. How many of you know the passage in, in uh, Corinthians where Paul says in chapter 5, he says this, If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The structure of what Paul is saying there is from Isaiah 65 and Isaiah 66. The new creation of the new heavens and the new earth in the age to come when the Lord returns, when Messiah is sitting on his throne. What Paul is saying to the church in Corinth is this. Not, if any man is in Christ, he's going to blow you up, destroy you, and create a, a new second version of you. No, he's going to regenerate you because you are the first fruits of the new creation. Remember when Jesus says, I long to cast fire on the earth. John the Baptist says, you're going to be baptized. He, I baptize you with fire, but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The baptism of the fire of the believer mirrors in a foreshadowing way the baptism of the earth in fire. Jesus is not going to destroy the earth at the end of the tribulation. He's going to return to it and restore the earth. This is, this changes everything, guys. From just a, you know, heavenly Jesus, heavenly gospel, heavenly hope to an earthly hope, an earthly gospel. The gospel of the kingdom is the gospel of the earthly reign of Messiah on the earth. You know, we've been so uh, led astray by bad teaching on what it means for the kingdom to come and what the kingdom is. When we look at the kingdom in the Old and the New Testament, the kingdom of God is actually the government of God that will come when the king comes at the end of the age. Now, we've so airy-fairied the, the message of the kingdom that, it, that anything's the kingdom now. You know, it's like the, you know, the, the soup kitchen outreach project is the kingdom coming to the inner city. It's not. 
That's not the kingdom coming to the inner city. The kingdom will come to the inner city of your hometown when the king returns and establishes his government, his rule, and his reign on the earth. That's the kingdom coming. You say, well, what about all these kingdom passages? Guys, the kingdom, the kingdom coming, the best way to describe the kingdom coming is in Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. You look at it, open it right now and read it through and go mull it over later and, and chew on this. At the sounding of the seventh trumpet, the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. The kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. He's going to shake everything that can be shaken and only that which can't be shaken will remain because we have an unshakable kingdom. The kingdom of God is not, you know, a good prayer and worship meeting, which a lot of people are like, oh, you know, we, the kingdom's here. No, guys, the kingdom's not, the presence of the Lord is here. The nearness of the Lord is here. The Lord himself is here, but the kingdom is not here until the king comes. Now, this is a big deprogramming that needs to take place in a large contingent of the body of Christ is reconsidering the nature of the kingdom of God. Now, I'm totally okay with using the colloquial terms kingdom for a thing, you know, like this is a kingdom work, a kingdom initiative, let's be kingdom minded. You know, we use kingdom a lot in vernacular ways in the body of Christ. It's okay. As long as we understand that the kingdom should not and cannot be equated with the church, the kingdom should not and cannot be equated with ministries of the church, the kingdom can, is, and should only be the kingdom. What is the kingdom? It's not the metaphorical administration in the spiritual realms. That's not the kingdom. The kingdom is the theocratic government of God on the earth. Say, I don't know, that seems a little bit too far. Uh, maybe the kingdom is here with us now. Maybe Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand. You know who else used that language of something being at hand? All the prophets. They spoke about a future day of the Lord and they said it's at hand. That does not mean that it's, you can reach out and touch it right now in some metaphysical, spiritual, allegorical way. Joel, for example, Joel says this, blow the trumpet in Zion for the king, for, not the king, for the day of the Lord is at hand. That's the same thing as John the Baptist or Jesus saying the kingdom of God is at hand. They're not saying it's coming in some, you know, non-tangible spiritual way that you can't see it, some invisible, you know, airy fairy way. What they're saying is in the same way that the day of the Lord was not in the day of Joel, meaning Joel's speaking, prophesying about the end of the age. And this is, you know, around 500, 600 BC. And Joel's saying the kingdom, sorry, the day of the Lord is at hand. You go, Joel, this is going to be like thousands of years until the day of the Lord is here. What do you mean it's at hand? And what Joel is saying is the reality of the coming of the day of the Lord is synonymous with the coming of the kingdom because the kingdom comes on the day the Lord comes. Now this is very critical thinking or critical thought process because so many of us have been so uh, bred on the, and fed on this idea that the kingdom is kind of can be whatever, whatever we want the kingdom to be. Anything that like has a Jesus sticker on it is the kingdom. And the problem with this logic is that it breaks down when we get into the book of Revelation and other passages in the Bible that clearly present the kingdom as being the actual theocratic government of God on the earth. Now you say, well, I can't go with you all the way on that yet, Dalton. Okay, that's fine. Study all the kingdom's passages and look at how future tense, how theocratic, how governmental they are. Another one that's very powerful is Matthew chapter 19. They're asking Jesus about things and Jesus says, look, in the regeneration or in the new world, in the kingdom, you guys are going to sit on 12 thrones and judge the 12 tribes of Israel in the land, in Jerusalem. You go, oh. So the regeneration is not some spiritual thing. It's tangibly actual thrones ruling and reigning. Remember what he said in Luke Jesus in, the, in, the, in Luke's gospel, he says this, if you're faithful and little, you're going to be faithful and much in the age to come. You're going to be rulers over 10 cities, 10 cities. What's the Sermon on the Mount? 
Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. For all, there's all these rewards. But one of the rewards is this. You will reign on the earth. The meek will inherit the earth. What does Acts chapter 3, 21 say? It says, Jerusalem, repent for the times of refreshing will come because heaven can't contain him forever and he will be sent. He will return to the earth. When he comes, he will restore all things and he'll make a new heaven and a new earth, not by blowing up the old one, but by restoring everything that's been corrupted, defiled, and broken from sin, depravity, and rebellion. Jesus is coming back to put the rebellion down, which leads us into the reality of the gravity of Revelation 5 that transitions into Revelation 6. Revelation 5, of these dynamic realities set the context for the tearing of the scroll, the taking of the scroll, I'm sorry, and the tearing of the seals that set in motion the judgments of God on the earth being released that lead to the splitting of the skies and the establishing of his kingdom in Jerusalem. Now, Revelation 5 is a very simple storyline. You can go word by word and look through it, but what I, what I want you to feel in this session to grapple with and walk away with and wrestle with is the implications of an earthly reign, not just of Messiah, but of you and I. Look at, again, look at the structure of the chapter. He has a scroll. No one can take it. That's the crisis. That's the dilemma. Someone says, no, no, someone can. John, stop weeping. Look, the lion. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the Jewish lion. Behold the man who comes from the the tribe of Jesse. Look at him. The tribe that David came from. Look at the tribe of Judah. He looks, he sees a lamb. He goes, worthy is the lamb to take the scroll. And throughout the book of Revelation, it's the lamb releasing the judgments, which presents a very diverse man, a very diverse man in the rest of the book of Revelation which culminates in this worthy song that you're worthy to take the scroll, open its seals, for you were slain, you bled, you redeemed us out of every tribe and nation, out of every tribe and nation. So not only do we have a great commission reality here that every nation will be reached because every nation, there has been people bought out of every tribe. I take Revelation 5 as a missions guy it very, uh, I hold this one very close to heart because Jesus gave his blood, gave his life to secure the redemption of a remnant from every single tribe and tongue and dialect in the world, which means this, we should have no fear. We should have no hesitation. We should have no reservations about giving everything we've got among the nations because a remnant from every nation has been bought with the blood of the lamb and a remnant from every nation who's been bought by the blood of the lamb will rule and reign on the earth with the lamb when he returns and establishes his throne and roars like a lion. There's a lot of lion passages in scripture. The one, one of the most powerful ones that I think that John is interacting with here when they say, behold, the lion in the tribe of Judah is Joel chapter three. In Joel chapter three, we read that at the end of the age, when Messiah returns, it says this, he will quote, roar like a lion from Mount Zion. What he's saying is, look, that man there is the one who's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. The one who's going to roar like a lion. John beholds him and says, but he's a lamb. He's a slain lamb. He says, yes, the judge of the living and the dead is also the savior of the world. He's also the sacrificial lamb. He's also the advocate. He's also the most furious man you've ever met is also the most gentlest man you've ever met. And I tell you this, Jesus gave his life and his blood for a heck of a lot more than just you being forgiven and going to heaven one day. Heaven is not going to abide forever. When Jesus returns at the end of the age, he's returning to the earth and we will reign on the earth with him. This changes our understanding of the future of time and eternity in ways that we can't even fathom. We have to get it into our 
mental scaffolding and get it into our emotions, get it into our DNA so that we can start thinking rightly about what follows in the rest of the book. Because if you don't connect with the earthly reign in chapter five, a lot of things are not going to make sense in the rest of the book. So it's imperative that we understand the good news of the judgment of God, that we understand the relationship between redemption and the consummation of all things. It's imperative that we understand the role, the relationship of prayer and the executing of judgments on the earth. And most importantly, it is essential that we understand and that we are consumed and obsessed with the worth of Jesus, Messiah. I thank you for watching this episode, this session. Next week, we're jumping headlong into some really heavy stuff in Revelation chapter 6 and the tearing of the first seal. Bless you from the Golan Heights and Maranatha.